Hello, everybody. We're ready to begin. Let me ask our panelists if they're ready to begin. I'd like to take an opportunity to describe a little bit about this panel before they start the show. Our panelists have already spoken to the EDI conference, which is Early Hearing Intervention and Detection. That conference took place last month, and they did such a wonderful job that the parents and attendees in the audience said that it was great, but they wanted to be able to access their stories and uh, their ideas once again. So we decided to ask them to come back and join us. My name is Beth Benedict. I would also like to introduce Marilyn Sassler, who is sitting in the audience helping coordinate this very wonderful panel and this excellent event. So we'll start with our student panelists. Please just tell us your name, where you're from, what standing you're in, and what major. Hello, my name is Shelby Bean, and I'm from Colorado. I'm a graduate student, first year in the International Development and MPA programs. Hello, my name is Mali Ganzafari. I'm from Ohio, Ohio, and I am a deaf education major, first year. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Nett Gomez, and I am a third year student here at Gallaudet University, majoring in social work, minoring in psychology, and I'm from Massachusetts. Hi, my name is Kaylee Gress. I'm from Nebraska. I'm a communication major and fourth year. Hello, my name is Sean Maywald. I'm a senior and majoring in government, and I'm from California. And hello, I'm Jonathan McMillan. I'm from three different places, DC, Maryland, and Virginia, the metro area. I'm a graduate student here at Gallaudet, majoring in sign language education. Thank you all for that introduction. All of them are Gallaudet students. <laughs> they forgot to mention that. I have several questions for the panelists, seven in total. You can see them here behind us on the slide. And the next slide will show the final three questions. Once our questions have been answered, we will have time at the end for any audience members, if they would like to, ask our panelists a question. So if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and your family. Sure, my family comes from a small town outside of Denver, Colorado. And I grew up uh, using speech and uh, was engaged in speech therapy my entire life. I did not know sign language. I did not meet members of the deaf community. I had 16 surgeries growing up. I had artificial ears um, placed in and cochlear implants, all in the effort to be quote unquote normal. I was in um, public mainstream schools. I was isolated. I did not interact um, with very many peers. I had a very small group of friends um, typically that was um, while I was engaged in sports and that's how Gallaudet found me um, and they recruited me to come and play football at Gallaudet. My family was actually from Iran, which is where I was born. We moved to America when I was two. My mother and my sister and myself. The three of us were living in Ohio. They're all hearing. I come from a hearing family. Farsi is the language that my mother and sister speak. That's native to them. They did not know American Sign Language, as did I. I did not know American Sign Language when we moved here. We moved to a very strong deaf community. So I was able to attend deaf clubs, go to camp, deaf camps, and I lived very close to a deaf residential school. I went to a mainstream school with hearing students for most of my educational career, and um, that's it. That's, that's my family. I was uh, born and raised by a hearing family. I am the only deaf member of the family. And there was an additional language barrier, which is that my family spoke Spanish. Uh, I went to mainstream schools. And I was told, and my family was told also to choose one language to use to communicate with me. And my mother disagreed. And um, because we were in America, we communicated using American Sign Language and English and not Spanish. So I had a lot of speech therapy growing up. Uh, 
the classes were difficult, the interpreters, um, having access to interpreters was difficult. It was um, pretty much eight years of hell, of navigating the school system. It was not easy for myself or my family. And my mother could see that I was not getting equal access to education. And um, that was my experience growing up. I come from a hearing family, and I'm the only deaf person in my family. My family was pretty unsure of what to do when I was born as deaf. My family is a military family, and we were from Oklahoma, and then we moved to Nebraska. My mom signed a little bit. My dad was working and traveling so much he wasn't able to pick up the language fluently. I grew up using signed exact English and didn't e learn um, American Sign Language until high school and really didn't become fluent in American Sign until college, Gallaudet. I grew up in San Jose, California. It was a very large city, but they had a very small deaf program. My uh, sister is deaf and both of my parents and the, the rest of my family members and relatives are hearing. But um, it's very important to note that my mother is a bilingual teacher, and so she applied her knowledge to how she communicated with me. She did not choose one language, but used multiple language in order to communicate with me and my deaf sister. And certainly me and my sister have a great connection. We connect to the world through language. Um, for example, last week I was on an airplane and this woman next to me, um, I mean, this is real life. This is really what happened. She wanted to have a conversation with me and she, in the end, found out all about deaf people. She did not know that there was a deaf community. When I told her that I came from a deaf family, she got very nervous and started to laugh. She said, wait a second, are you saying that all members of your family are deaf? And I said, yes, absolutely. So because I had deaf family members, I had deaf parents, I had access to language from day one, my identity did not come to me through language. When I saw people who did not sign, I thought they were weird. And then my parents would tell me, remember your aunts and uncles are hearing and they don't necessarily sign all the time, they speak. So my experience growing up was very special. I felt like I was paid attention to, I was provided language access, I was provided love. And so my whole entire life growing up, I was really ready to just pursue my dreams without having to struggle to develop an identity. And I really have to thank my family for that. Thank you all. So we have five panelists who come from hearing families and one panelist who has deaf parents. And that's pretty representative of the deaf population. The statistics say that 90% of deaf children are born to parents who can hear and the other 10% are born to deaf parents. So we have a pretty representative group of what you would see in the educational experience of deaf children across America. Now, if you could describe some of your early educational experiences and what you remember about those early years. I remember that I missed a lot of class time for speech therapy, specifically English class. So I felt that I was missing out on what was being um, taught in the classes, what was being read because I was pulled out for speech therapy. Later in high school I struggled because my reading skills were not up to par with my peers um, I was lacking in um, grammatical skills. I felt limited in so many ways because so much time was spent on speech therapy. When I arrived to high school, I did not want speech therapy any further. I didn't need it anymore. And I started to realize that I was falling behind, um, falling behind my peers, and that was very frustrating for me, especially in English. Math, I did fine and excelled there, but English was a struggle for me. Now, as a student at Gallaudet, I have full access to a visual language that has allowed me to develop my writing and reading skills, and I've seen a great improvement since I've been here. 
If you um, remember, I mentioned that I was born in Iran and moved to America when I was only two. So it wasn't just me, but my whole entire family didn't have any exposure to English. At first, my mom thought an oral program would be the best for me. And I was there in preschool for two or three years. I really don't remember much. The oral program did not work for me. I'm completely deaf. Even though my mother tried to put me in an oral program, we were all motivated and actually I wasn't that motivated. In fact, I remember my mom telling me I rebelled a few times. So I went to elementary school with a deaf program for first, second, and third grade with a hearing teacher. This hearing teacher was trained in teaching deaf children but used signed exact English. And I remember really struggling to understand this teacher and I remember coming home every day crying because I didn't have a good command of English and I didn't have a good command of really any language. The other kids in the class had deaf parents who knew American Sign Language and they were excelling and I was falling behind because I didn't have the same type of access to a language. So I was later placed in fourth, fifth, well, third, fourth, and fifth grade with a deaf teacher and that's where my English really improved because I was so proud of being a deaf person and I got that sense from my teacher. She was a proud deaf person, she married a deaf man and from there not only did I learn American Sign Language so that I was comfortable communicating with not only my classmates but other deaf people but my English got so much better both the way I was able to read and write English. And so that's pretty much my experience uh, being mainstreamed early on. <coughs> so as I had mentioned earlier, my first eight years were very difficult. Uh, when I enrolled in schools, I did not have certified interpreters working. There was uh, no mention of captioning services or note takers. I didn't even know they existed until high school or college. You know, I realized that by not having these tools, I missed out on a lot of information and access. Luckily at home, my parents read with me a lot, and so that helped. Um, and at the school, there were a couple of interpreters available to six or seven of us. And even though I was more advanced in my English um, and literacy skills, I was, I was placed in classes with the rest of the deaf students because of the limited number of interpreters, which really lowered the expectations of the work that I could do. And once I arrived to high school, there were um, simple, mathematical. simple mathematical problems that I was not able to um, solve because I did not have full access to my education. I was often either pulled out of class or I was sitting in the front of the class and there were interpreters there, but the interpreters were not properly trained in the code of ethics. They did not approach their work so that I was able to access education. And so my family had to then engage in the school's district to fight to allow me to commute to a school where I would have access to communication. So it took me an hour to get to school and it took me an hour to get home. I would miss dinner time. I would miss time to play with my friends after school. I could not engage in sports um, or softball. I missed a lot. Um, but I went to EDCO and that prepared me for college. Even though there was the commute, it prepared me and, it, and I'm now a student at Gallaudet and the rest is history. Growing up in a small town, I had uh, similar experiences, but we used total communication and signed exact English. ASL was not allowed. So I entered a public school being the only deaf student. And because I was in a mainstream school, there were, um, I, I used interpreters to get through school, but there were low expectations on me. I, I did better than what they expected of me. I knew that I was missing out on a lot of different activities, for example, art and music, because I had to go to speech therapy. But I stopped going to speech therapy once I got into high school so that I could get back and focus on my academics. Now, as I mentioned earlier, my mother is a bilingual teacher, and so it was important that she knew how to instill and expose language to children. She found out I was deaf a few days after I was born, 
And the first thing she did was to try to start signing with me, which is so important because uh, when I would go to school in the mainstream programs with sign language interpreters, I knew that I was missing out. I knew that I wasn't getting full access, and so I essentially had to teach myself. And so, uh, you know, it did teach me how to be independent. Um, I also engaged a lot in speech therapy, and honestly, I felt it was uh, a waste of my time. It is a benefit, and it's a positive thing, yes, but I don't feel as though it benefits me today because even though I can speak well, it doesn't mean that I can understand people in turn. So I always had a hard time with my um, social life. Uh, it was difficult for me to make friends, and I did that by engaging in sports and playing football, and I enjoyed that very much. And then I came to Gallaudet, and I realized how much I had missed in my classes before then. And I developed my identity as a deaf person here at, at Gallaudet University. Education is a learning process. And for me, education only happens when communication is available. Education is there for the mind, the body, and the spirit, for the purposes of learning so many other things. It is not just what happens in a classroom or a school system. So my educational progress happened at school, of course, in classrooms, but also by my friends, by joining different organizations, going out and doing activities with families and friends on the weekends, because I had direct <laughs> access to communication on a daily basis. I don't feel like my educational experience happened between the hours of 8 and 4, and then learning was suspended overnight until I got back up and into school 8 o'clock the next morning. My learning process was continuous. It never stopped. And I had a really thirst. I had a real thirst for knowledge, and education so helped as well. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing your stories. All of you have very unique backgrounds. Uh, you know, the third and fourth questions that I have here, I think, could be asked simultaneously. The first one asks, when were your first interactions with deaf adults or other deaf children, and what impact did they have on you? And the fourth question is, for those of you who um, have hearing parents, what were their first interactions with deaf adults? And what impact do you think that they had on your um, parents or your family, if any? Well, my first interaction was here at Gallaudet six years ago. I uh, did not visit campus before I um, enrolled. I had um, committed to playing football, and I showed up two weeks before football camp, and I was clueless about everything. And it was a very overwhelming experience. I felt um, it very awkward and difficult to communicate. I was 17. I, I was not... Um, as mature as I am today. And at the same time, it was awkward for me um, to um, be at home. I'm sorry, for my, it was awkward for my parents because it was their first time also interacting with deaf people. And I think it impacted my dad the most when he met a deaf person. He said that before he left campus, he said that I would stay here forever. He felt like this was going to become my second home, and he was right. This has become my home for the last six years. So he had um, a great impact by being here. He knew that I would grow here, that I would learn to love myself and develop a strong identity. So it's been a good experience in that sense. And uh, what was the second question? <coughs> When was your parents' first experience interacting with deaf adults? You know, I think you've already answered that, but so you said that your first deaf person that you met was here at Gallaudet, and did you realize that there were a lot of other people here at Gallaudet like you? Yes, I actually was very surprised at how many people came from mainstream schools. And even here on this panel, five of us were in mainstream public schools and only one of us were at residential schools. So I was able to connect with my peers. My roommate uh, had come from the exact same background that I did. And uh, again, you know, I have found friends through playing sports who are still very close to me today. And I never again felt isolated the way I used to. 
I feel very engaged. I feel like I'm a member of the deaf community and I feel very proud of it. People often ask me, why did you move to America and Ohio specifically? Well, my mother had a friend who knew a deaf person and had many members of deaf, uh, m many members of that family were deaf. And so we moved to the area that was close to that family and met another deaf family. They have many deaf kids and that was my first exposure to deaf children. And I can never remember a time not hanging around with that family. That helped my language develop and that helped my mom see the benefit of American Sign Language. She took me out of the oral program that she had put me in, and she, in fact, herself and my sister both learned sign language so that they could talk to me. Not only about the language, but more about culture and the community. I can remember going over to this deaf family's house and my mom asking a lot of questions about the deaf community and what the norms were. So because of the fact that we knew this deaf family and because I was in a deaf program at school, those are the first deaf individuals that both myself and my family met. I can remember going to deaf clubs for at least 12 years from the ages of nine to about 17, 18 years old. So I had a pretty, I would say growing up, my experience hanging out with deaf individuals and deaf adults was pretty heavy and, and extremely positive. Hmm. So I'm thinking about how to respond to this question. You know, my mom and I had already had interactions with deaf people through um, doc doctor's appointments at children's hospitals. Um, we met deaf individuals who provided us resources and tools. We met with individuals from the AG Bell organization. And everybody had different opinions and different perspectives. And uh, my mother would engage in all of these types of conversations and then would make her own decision for what was best for me and my family. And my mother wanted me to access both English and ASL and, and to be able to speak fluently. So at home, uh, we often would use um, spoken language. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom would call me and I would say, Mom, you know I can't hear you if you're calling me from another room. But, um, and, and my mother learned, and we all learned how to interact with one another. Now, outside of the home, I did experience bullying, bullying by deaf people, bullying by hearing people. I wasn't deaf enough, I wasn't hearing enough. You know, who was I? I was always in the middle. I always had to create my own path, as though I didn't fit in any already established path. And I walked that path alone. And then when I got my cochlear implant at 13, you know, I had gone to different organizations and they practiced um, the oral approach only. There were other programs that used both um, spoken English and sign language. But I really wanted to develop my sign language because if I were to ever lose my hearing completely, which it would happen, I would want to be able to have full access to expressing myself and communicating with those around me. And so I decided that sign language was the language that I needed to immerse myself in and my family supported that decision. So uh, you know, coming here to Gallaudet has allowed me to be who I am today and has allowed me to integrate all types of perspectives into who I am. I was with the same group of uh, deaf students from preschool all the way on up. Um, in college, we sort of spread out. But my deaf role model is Lindsay Darnell. Is like a stepfather to me. I can remember him taking me out to different deaf activities and uh, making sure that I was always exposed to American Sign Language. And then I have Miss Brown, was a counselor of mine who would sit around in class and teach us sign language and we would talk about our feelings. You know, growing up in mainstream schools, a lot of people say that they felt like they were isolated. And even though there was a deaf program and there was other deaf students, I was in an honors program with interpreters. And so I really did not know who I was. I felt similar to Kelly Ned. I wasn't hearing enough. I wasn't deaf enough. I can speak well and I can sign well, but I always felt right in the middle. 
I had to find my own path, and that wasn't until college, until I was able to really develop an identity. And developing an identity is so important, and I think that comes from who your deaf role models were. Uh, my very first interaction with another deaf person was my sister. She um, is my role model. She's four years older than I am, and uh, you know, she was always a few years ahead of me in school. So when she was in high school, I was in middle school, and she was playing sports, and so I therefore knew I could play sports. So I always looked up to her, and it helped me develop confidence because I saw what she was capable of doing, and it made me realize that I was capable of doing the same things. Um, and in terms of other adults, you know, it was very interesting with my mom. She wasn't sure exactly what to do with my sister and I when we were born, um, and she found that we were deaf. She knew that there were different educational approaches, and there was one mainstream program near my home, and there was a deaf teacher who signed and was very successful herself, and so my mother thought, well, if she could be successful as a deaf teacher, so can my children. And so that gave my mom a lot of hope. Um, and, you know, when I interacted with other peers in my high school program, there were not a lot of deaf people. And if there were, they um, were delayed. A lot of them had other dis disabilities. And so it was hard um, for me to interact really with either the hearing or the deaf community. I was more, um, I, I functioned alone for the most part. I did not connect completely with either group. But now that I'm here, I'm able to connect with peers who, um, you know, have similar beliefs and interests. You know, just to piggyback on that comment, my parents, you know, obviously saw successful members of the deaf community So parents in general can, if they subscribe to one ideology, it can be very dangerous. You can't just see something or be presented some information and accept that as fact. Oftentimes people are told that everything that deaf people cannot do, and they don't challenge that ideology as if it was fact until you finally meet another deaf adult and you say to yourself, oh wow, they can do all of the things I was told that my son or daughter could not do. Coming from a deaf family, I engaged with the deaf community, again, from a very early age. Um, my grandparents were hearing, so I am second generation deaf, but my parents didn't have any language until they, my dad specifically, didn't have any language until he was five years old. My dad thought to understand the world, he had to speak, and he worked very hard at trying to practice his speech until finally he met someone that told him about a deaf residential school. They had never known about that. And at that deaf residential school, there are very successful deaf teachers. And so that was my dad's experience. He didn't meet a deaf person until he was five years old. My mom went to a deaf residential school as well. And once that ideology for them changed, they were able to pass that down to me and my brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. Okay, we are now into our second slide. And uh, the next question is, who were your role models? I know some of you have mentioned some of your role models, but if you could talk more about your role models and why you've chosen them as your role model. And I will go ahead and uh, begin with Kaylee. As I mentioned, I had two role models. They were both deaf. They taught me how important it was to socialize with peers, to be able to understand one another so that I wouldn't feel so isolated. I had been pretty much forced to sign exact English. And then when I met these role models, I was able to have a better understanding of not only American Sign Language, but the culture that goes along with it. I was taken to deaf clubs, and I hung out with deaf adults. I saw that these deaf adults were working individuals contributing to society. A lot of them had college degrees. And I heard about Gaudet University, but I didn't know if it was a right fit for me. I really didn't know if I was going to be accepted. It wasn't until my senior year in high school that I finally decided I'm going to go to Gallaudet. And I'm so glad that I made that decision because now I have friends. Now I feel not isolated. I really have developed a strong identity in a positive way. And I would never have been able to do that without my two role models. 
You know, as I mentioned already, my role model um, is definitely my sister, but I have several role models. Um, you know, there are other uh, deaf adults, and I was always engaging in what they were doing, and I knew, um, you know, who the deaf people were because I always rode the small bus, and uh, so I was able to interact with deaf adults and. I realized that I was capable of doing all of the things that they were doing. So as I mentioned, uh, growing up in a deaf family, being heavily involved in the deaf community, I had an identity as a deaf person since the day I was born. So my role models really were developed through my hobbies because I, I was able to learn what I wanted out of life. My hobbies allowed me an avenue to explore the world and see what life was really all about. Uh, my role model is my former uh, football coach, John Davis. He is hearing, but uh, was fluent in American Sign Language and a great advocate of the deaf community. So when I got to Gallaudet, I was homesick and feeling awkward, and he worked um, very closely with me, encouraged me to meet other deaf people like me, and really led me on the path to where I am today. I, I would not be where I am today without him. He was very supportive. He was like a second father, second family to me, and I owe my degree to him. And my success was because, in large part, of his support and his guidance. I would not be here if it wasn't for my role model. And I had mentioned that was my deaf teacher, Marianne Corbett. Why I've picked her my role, as my role model? Well, once again, um, within my family, we didn't have much to talk about because of our limited access to communications. We couldn't talk about world news. My favorite day was Fridays when we went to class with Marianne Corbett. Every Friday, we would have open discussions about what was really going on in the world. We'd have political discussions and talk on hours upon hours about the news that was happening. And I just felt like that was such a gain to me. I, it opened up a whole new world because I was able to talk about my feelings and abstract ideas. Even though I was in a mainstream school, I had access to this deaf push teacher who taught me so much. Um, you know, I have um, had a lot of deaf individuals interact with my family, but um, there is one person who appeared, and she really had a great impact. Uh, Miss Peggy Lee, she used to work for the Massachusetts Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. And uh, she doesn't work there anymore now, but at that time, I was fighting for my right to leave my school district because of the poor educational levels and the lack of qualified interpreters and uh, they wanted to um, place me in a high school or college course, and they actually had different tracks, humanities, um, you know, sciences, and I was gonna be placed into performing arts, and I am not a thespian, I do not like to perform. I did not wanna be tracked in that. I know it included dance, which just doesn't make sense because I can't hear. And uh, so I wanted to go to the leadership school. I did not want to go to the performing arts school, and so I had to fight for that. And um, Peggy Lee um, is a child specialist, and she came to work with me as an advocate. And so she actually would go to the schools and uh, make sure that there were standards in place, there were systems in place. She would do quality checks in terms of deaf education and access to the children. Um, related to interpreters, IEPs. She knew that I wasn't happy. She knew that my mother was struggling to get me out of that school. And with that information, she stepped up. She showed up to every meeting. She showed up to all of my meetings that had to do with um, this battle of getting me to move to schools. She would come to my home and, and give us tips. She came to court with us. And today, she is a great friend of our family. You know, she was the one who made me believe that it was possible for me to graduate from college. She was the one who said I could go to college. 
I thought I wouldn't go to college. I thought I would end my educational career after high school. But she was the one who encouraged me to um, apply to three different colleges. One uh, was the Rochester Institute for the Technology, which serves both deaf and, and uh, hearing individuals, Gallaudet University, and another um, mainstream uh, university or college. And I got into all three. And I thank her so much for everything that she did for us. As each of you are speaking, I'm getting goosebumps. I hope you've all had an opportunity to thank your respective mo role models. Absolutely, yes. I think you've already said this, but in your opinion, what's the value of having a role model for a young deaf child in their family? Maybe to have that role model integrated or as a part of your family, I'm wondering what if in fact you think it is positive, what effect do they have um, on you? And then in turn, what advice could you give to the families out there that have just found out that they have young deaf babies and young deaf infants? What advice would you give to them? My advice to the parents and or professionals, I just suggest that you provide any avenue of communication access, whether or not it's through technology, American Sign Language, or spoken English. You have to really pay attention to what your child seems to be more um, to, to gravitate towards and support that method. You don't want your child to feel isolated or pressure or any kind of angst in terms of developing their identity. There's a lot of options out there, a lot of educational options, but just make sure you think about how they're experiencing life. Put yourself in their shoes. I would really advocate for teaching them sign language because I really feel like that's where my education uh, just soared. I think having deaf role models is very important. Uh, and not only deaf, a deaf role model, but any role model that can empower uh, these children to uh, it, succeed. You know, my philosophy is that you provide families with all options, not one thing or the other. Uh, certainly expose them to information about sign language and literacy and um, hearing aids and cochlear implants. And then people then can make educated decisions about how they want to communicate and how they want to access the world around them for children to have that opportunity and for families to have that opportunity is very empowering. And so I think that, you know, for families to have role models, that role model is someone that needs to provide um, fair, um, diverse information and resources for families um, and for students so that they are empowered to make their own decisions. I agree, Albert Einstein at one point talked about He said to a monkey one day, you know, a fish can't climb a tree. A fish is going to live its whole entire life thinking, I can't climb a tree. But they're not naturally supposed to climb a tree. They're supposed to be in the water and swim. So everyone has their own natural inclinations. We're all different types of people using different types of languages. And everybody's mentioned giving opportunities to the deaf child. So if you're a parent out there and you're afraid or nervous, I completely understand that. You're going to go through this process, and it's a very natural one. But you need to find support, support that will allow for you to see some sign of hope, because that will give you hope to allow your deaf child to succeed and you have a better life. Yeah, I, I agree with what's been said. My um, one piece of advice would be to keep an open mind. Do not limit yourself to one or two options. Try something, and if it doesn't work, try something else, even if it feels awkward. Um, the point is for your child to develop and focus on what is allowing the child to develop. You know, if it's awkward for you, it's probably awkward for them too. But if everyone could work together as a team, um, you know, I mean, this is an experience for both the children and the families. This is an opportunity to bond. Uh, you know, with my experience in having 16 surgeries through those difficult times, that is where I developed very strong bonds with my parents. 
And you can do the same with your own children by keeping an open mind and doing what's best for all of you as a family. I would agree, an open mind is key. In Iran, the deaf community there is not so strong. And deaf people are not viewed as um, having any hope for having a good life. And my mother believed in that ideology. But there was something a little bit wrong with it because she did move us over here to America. And I think having deaf role models not only was such a huge influence on me, but more importantly so on my mom and my sister. So please keep an open mind and don't be afraid to ask for help and support. The deaf community members are so willing to help families out. My mom got so much, as a hearing mother, she got so much support from the deaf community and that was only because she kept an open mind. So I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about the fact that I have many identities. You know, it's not just about being deaf or hearing. Uh, we all come from very unique cultures and ethnic backgrounds. All of that should be incorporated and shared um, in your lives. You know, I come from a Latino uh, family and unfortunately, <coughs> my mother did not use Spanish to communicate with me. And now, as a result of that, I'm not fluent in Spanish. But why, why didn't we go ahead and use all three uh, languages in our home? And I, I think that's unfortunate. And that would be one piece of advice that I would have, is to incorporate all identities and uh, you know, believe in intersectionality, that we are of many identities and we can represent a whole being um, and you can raise your child to do that. And everybody has different ways of incorporating um, your own culture or language or backgrounds into the home. It's not just about um, the language that they're communicating, but it's about, um, for example, if you, are a, if you have a black deaf child, find a, a black deaf adult who is working as a, a lawyer or, or working for airlines and, and have your child exposed to these people. You know, there are so many different identities that our children can engage with, but oftentimes we expect people to choose one identity over another. Um, but rather, you should in have their, your child incorporate all types of identities because you want your child to be able to answer the question, who am I, when they grow up. Just real quick, I totally agree with you. My mom didn't teach me Farsi either. <coughs> Excellent advice. Thank you all very much. Uh, we do have some time for questions from the audience. If you do have questions, please feel free to stand and I will repeat the question for the audience. Okay, the question is, How did your parents feel when they found out that you were deaf when you were born? My mom found out that I was deaf when I was two and a half years old. So that was much later. And now we have the uh, hearing uh, newborn screening program, um, which reduces that time, that missed time of, of language and communication. But for my mother, um, it was very difficult for her. She had to grieve and she did grieve through the process. Um, my father was not in the picture. He, he was informed of the fact that I was deaf. And, um, you know, I'm so grateful for my mother. She, once she found out that I was deaf, she went to the Children's Hospital, um, began a dialogue in terms of what I needed as a deaf baby. And, um, but, you know, unfortunately, it was only professionals that advised my mother. And that's why I lost access to Spanish language. Um, and also, uh, most of these professionals are white women and uh, then don't understand how important it is to incorporate uh, the family's dominant language, which in my case was Spanish. You know, for those of you who are professionals and advising uh, people of color, encourage them to become um, doctors and speech pathologists and audiologists so that they can go out and connect with deaf clients and families of deaf babies and represent multiple identities. Uh, 
my parents went through a similar grieving process when my sister was born. It was a little better with me, but when my sister was born, they didn't know whether or not she would be successful. And then later on, when I was born, when I was born, they knew what to do. And they knew that I could be successful because they had already been through that experience with my sister. But it's very difficult for parents, for hearing parents, when the first deaf person they meet is their own child. And so I think what's important is providing that family early ro uh, role models early on in that child's life. And just to add to that, you know, we talked about the importance of hope. You know, for parents to realize that their children can do anything. You know, a, a parent asked us before, um, you know, that w what kind of job do you all have in, in, in line? What kinds of work are you all thinking about getting into? We understand that you have deaf pride, but what about work? And uh, you know, we explained that we felt and believed that we could do anything. You know, my uh, friend is um, a receptionist at the White House in the West Wing, um, Leah Katz Hernandez. And that just makes me and, and should have everyone realize that deaf people can do anything. At four months old, my mom suspected that I was deaf, but she was in denial. My dad said, take her to the doctor. And then finally, once I was eight months old, the doctors in Iran aren't that good. They're not um, on par with the American medical field. So we got a second opinion. We flew to Germany. And in fact, they said, I am deaf. That was about the age of one. And my mother grieved. And grieved so much, she decided to move us to America to get cochlear implant surgery. I didn't end up getting a cochlear implant because of the exposure that we got here when we were in America, but my mom grieved those first couple of years, but now she's extremely happy. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Is there anything that, oh, okay, you have a question? Sure. So do your parents sign with you today? Are they fluent? My mom signs definitely good enough for me to communicate, and my sister signs with me. She's very fluent. Uh, no one in my family signs. And I am 21 now, and my mother just went to the Beverly School for the Deaf to take sign language classes. It took 21 years, but I'm very happy. And I think it, you know, the reason why she made that um, decision was because I presented at a conference and I said that one of my biggest regrets was that my family doesn't sign. And so she is now taking sign language classes. You know, it, it's been 21 years, but hey, it's never too late. My dad signs not great. My mom can sign signed exact English, but you know what? Every once in a while, some ASL comes out of her, and I'm not exactly sure where that come from. That comes from. I think possibly that's just because of the role models we had. My one sister just seems to be totally against sign language. She will only talk to me. My older sister will sign. She's definitely not fluent. She knows signed exact English, but she doesn't know American sign language. So my sister's a better signer than my parents. My parents uh, learned American Sign Language as I was growing up and they were fluent. And then when I got a little bit older and after high school uh, and uh, of course college, I'm not at home with them so much. Um, they definitely are not as fluent. But um, you know the fact that they made that effort growing up um, has been very important for me. My parents know some basic signs, thank you, please, milk, food. They express an interest in learning sign language now, but they saw me sign as a baby pardon the interpreter they saw me signing to a baby and they um, that really impacted them and 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 now they're starting to learn sign language 
you know, just as you said, it's never too late, right? Okay, we have another question from the audience. So for those of you who have cochlear implants, does that help you even now? Um, you know, it doesn't really help me here, but I, I do like to hear environmental sounds. I'm used to it. I grew up with that. I feel like something's missing if it's not on. I mean, it doesn't necessarily help me, you know, interact here, but it just is part of who I am. I've had it since I was very young, so. I got my cochlear implant when I was 13 years old and used it up until I graduated from high school. On and off, you know, I struggled with the technology because I was struggling with my identity. Sometimes I would, you know, throw it away. Sometimes I would just accidentally lose it. My mom would get mad. But once I got into college, I just realized I didn't need it anymore. I knew I wasn't going to need it for my college years here at Gallaudet. And I don't use it, uh, I don't use my cochlear implant anymore. I currently have an uh, internship for social work at a hearing agency, and I do realize that I'm going to be using it again. So this summer, I'm going to go back home and practice with my cochlear implant. Once I find the actual equipment, I'm going to put it back on my head and start to practice again because it is a helpful tool, but I will say it's a helpful tool. It doesn't solve everything. I got my cochlear implant when I was three, and so I use it. I have always used it um, because my family members do not sign, and um, they are actually going to be coming here this May when I graduate, and I know that they are going to feel culture shock. It's going to be very quiet and silent here for them. But uh, when I got to Gallaudet, I came here, um, in, in, and during my first year, I thought about not using it, but um, I do still use it. Um, it's something that I feel more comfortable with. Sometimes I do take it off here in the classes um, because we are using American Sign Language. Um, but when I go back home, I will use it. Uh, sometimes my parents forget that I, I can't hear if I'm sleeping and I have my cochlear implant off and they're trying to get my attention um, verbally. But you know, it's important to remember that having a cochlear implant does not make you hearing. It just helps you hear. I have hearing aids, I don't have a cochlear implant, and in the mainstream program, it sort of made it harder for me, because as soon as someone saw that um, hearing aid on my ear, they thought that I could speak, and they would speak to me. And for example, I would, you know, because they thought I could hear, because they thought I could speak, they would get up in front of the class and just present without any sign language, without any other technology, no, terp no interpreter, anything. So it, it was really kind of a hindrance for me. I knew my li limitations. I knew what I could and couldn't do, but at that time it wasn't really supportive. It also wasn't helping my identity develop either. So having the hearing aid, again, was really sort of detrimental because people thought that because I was wearing the technology that I could hear and they didn't want to find another way to communicate with me where I could have understood them easier. So there's some pros and cons because I do hear more when I put it on. Thank you very much. And, and in the interest of time, we'll end here. Thank you all for sharing your story. I think that you have made some very important points like um, it's important to have role models and people who are working. <laughs> you know, a lot of times people are shocked to know that in the United States we have over um, 400 deaf attorneys. And so that just shows that we have people working um, in, the, in this country. We have people who are working, who aren't working. We have people who are teachers. We have people who are doctors. We have people working for the White House. And so there is a, a range of um, experiences among deaf and hard of hearing people, which is in line with hearing people in the United States. So in closing, I'd like to ask all of you what your future plans are. I know that you are in graduate school, um, but if you could just quickly talk about your goals for the future. I would actually like to continue coaching football here. I'd like to stay here at Gallaudet um, and maybe even set up different youth uh, sports programs and travel internationally with that. I definitely want to continue on in deaf education, perhaps be an elementary school teacher. 
And after Eddie conference, I thought about maybe becoming an early interventionist. So I'm going to respond with two things. I've always been uh, interested in early intervention, but my current job is working with student development. So I'm working in higher education. And so I'm thinking, you know, I might want to go into both fields, maybe working with um, those families um, with children who are birth to three, and then also those who are in college and those t two different demographics. I like working with people, so I was thinking about possibly a, f a future career in HR, but I haven't determined it yet. My other dream is to own my own business, some sort of international business, to be able to develop better access for deaf people across the globe. I have an internship this summer with Congress, and I wouldn't mind becoming a lawyer, a, a congressman, or a senator. I would like to um, become engaged in the United States government and, and make a difference. I have so many fields. The problem with me is to narrow it down. My goal is to become a university pre presenter. I'm working on a book right now I want to get published. And I also want to continue on with my project called Hands Land. Um, and it's a program for uh, children who are ages zero to six. We just had six other participants. Ask him as well. Just six other participants. And um, I want to make sure that my project, Hands Land, continues and grows. Wonderful. Thank you all for sharing your dreams. And uh, I don't think it's just a dream. I think that your goals are very realistic and they will come true. And I am ready to watch you all grow and be successful. Thank you all very much for your work. And we're all very proud of you. And thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Captioner. <laughs>